Good afternoon, brothers and sisters. How are you all doing this afternoon? My name is Neil Parsonal. I'm one of the lay ministers attached to the to the Santa Rosa Parish, and I'll take you through this afternoon's proceedings, the workshop that we're having. And we're talking today about the gift of or the sacrament of reconciliation, or the sacrament of penance, as some of us knew it before. So I want to lay some foundations for us before we go into the wider, the, the wider topic. We talk about this as a sacrament. So what is a sacrament? You remember how the church defined a sacrament, how we define what a sacrament is? Anybody wants to tell me the definition of a sacrament? Sacrament is an outward sign of inward grace by which grace is given to our souls. So it's an outward sign, and in the sacrament of confession or of penance or whatever we choose to call it, there's an outward sign that we go to the priest. We would go to the priest and say, you know, I have sinned, and then if the in Father would, would grant us absolution, and that's the inward grace that we receive, that God would have forgiven us through Father, through the priest, that God would forgive us of our sins. So there's an outward sign of an inward grace. So nobody can see what is happening inside of us after we receive the absolution. Something that is inward, something that is happening inside. Over the years, the sacrament has undergone some main changes. Because in the early, early days, it was called the sacrament of penance. So you went, you know, you're going to, it was the sacrament of penance. And what that said to a number of people was, was it's very punitive. You know, you're going and all people remember was the father telling to see ten Hail Marys and four fathers. Remember that time? So it was penance. You're going to get penance. And those of us who were in secondary school, you remember when you get penance. And you had to write the lines, you know, the way of the transgressor is exceedingly and extremely and, and all of that, you know. The, so you get penance, so you had to write lines, whatever lines, so you had to write an essay, or, so that was penance. And nobody liked penance. And then we moved, we you know, talked about the sacrament of confession. So we moved from the very punitive, you know, you're coming for penance. And we talked about confession, where you were able to unburden yourself. And you were able to place yourselves and make yourself vulnerable to Jesus Christ. And you're making yourself vulnerable by confessing your sins. And what that did is that it, it, it encouraged people to come with a list. So you had a litany. So Father, this is the list. Teeth the sugar, teeth the milk, customer model, and you, and you just rattle off the list. And that was the end of that. So you confess your sins. And then Father would do the absolution and, and then you move on from there. Of late, over the more, within more recent times, the church has talked about the sacrament of reconciliation. The sacrament of reconciliation. In other words, the purpose of this, the purpose of going through this exercise it's not just simply for you to get penance. Say ten Hail Marys, you know, and four other fathers. It's not just for you to come out and, and recite a litany of sins. But really to effect that reconciliation, that coming back together between you and whomever you sinned against. Amen? Between you and the community. Because sin is not just personal. Sin is between you and family. Sin is between you and your community. Sin is between you and church. Sin is between you and country. Sin is not just you. It's not just you and it's something that you. Sin is, is, is you and everybody. So that there is a community that is affected by sin. And therefore the church has moved to the point of saying this is the sacrament of reconciliation where you must be reconciled with those whom you have offended. That is why when we have a fight, we say you have to apologize to the person. And you can't just say, I'm sorry. And someone can say, well, but I say I'm sorry. 
is not just that. There is an apology, there is reconciliation that takes place. And what the church attempts to do now is to get to the source, the source of why is it that you have this ongoing feud with your family? Why is it you have this ongoing resentment and anger? Let's deal with that. Let's deal with why is it you feel you know, compelled to return to the sin you have been forgiven time and time again. What is this weakness? And how can we as church help in this weakness? Yeah. Because if every time you go to confession, you have to confess that you and your brother fight. Or you cost, you, you, you cost the neighbor. But then there has to be something there. And we need to treat with that. So there's reconciliation that has to take place. And so we've moved over the years from the sacrament of penance, then we went to confession, and it's now reconciliation. Now these three are there. Penance is there because you have to, you, you, you must do your, your, your penance. Confession is there, you must confess the sin. But the next step is reconciliation. And as we would have listened today to the gospel passage, or Luke, Luke, Luke the, the, the gospel passage, you know, from Luke, with the story of the prodigal son. And the prodigal son went through all of those things. He had to confess his sins. He had to do penance. But he also had to be reconciled as well. Amen? Amen. So that's what this sacrament is about. To destroy, there's a myth that as young people, or as, or as Catholics, we would hear all the time. Why confess our priests? And no other, no other church does do that, and you know, no other religion does do that. Why you must confess your sins to a priest? John chapter 20, verses 20, 22 to 24, says very, very clearly to us. I want us to understand this. John says, after saying this, Jesus breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Those who, if you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you retain anyone's sins, they are retained. Jesus was speaking to his disciples. Whoever sins you forgive, they are forgiven. Whoever sins you retain, they are retained. So when anybody comes to you with any kind of dudish talk about you shouldn't confess to no priest because he is mad and he does sin too, we know that already. We know Father is a man. We know Father is, is, is human like everybody else, and Father is Father will say. That's why as Father, as Father indicated earlier today, he too goes to confession. He too goes to confession as a penitent. The Pope goes to confession. None of us is immune from that. And we know that all have fallen, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So no one better than anybody else. But the fact is that Jesus Christ has commissioned his priests and has given them the authority to forgive sins and to retain sins. So I want us to keep that. Just anytime anybody comes to you with that, just refer them to John chapter 20, verses 22 to 24. Jesus breathed on them, said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Whoever sins you forgive, they are forgiven. Whoever sins you retain, they are retained. The difficulty we have, sisters and brothers, is that going to confession forces us to confront the things that, that we don't like about ourselves. Amen? The things we're uncomfortable with. It means that we have to be vulnerable. We make ourselves vulnerable before God. It's like, it's like standing naked, buck naked before a mirror or before someone. You're vulnerable. You're there in all your nakedness when you go to confession. Because it's just you and God now. And you're telling God, this is me. This is me. Everybody probably thinks that I am this or I am that, but this is me. I know my sin. I know my sin. And, and therefore it becomes uncomfortable. So many of us have a challenge in going to confession. In fact, I remember when, you know, growing up, very much in situations like this, they used to have the force us to go to confession. Do you remember them days? 
very confirmation class. The, the same thing they do with all yeah? The same thing they do here. Where they have, you know, you organize it's almost like a line. And it's good, you, you go now, you go now, you go now, you go now. And I went to a Catholic school. So I went to St. Mary's College. So you had days to go to confession. And the teacher would be there, and line by line. And because of that, over the years, some of us have gotten very, you know, very shy, very wary about going to confession. And I really hope that today, you know, we're able to see the value of, of utilizing the sacrament of reconciliation. I want you to, to, to use that word, the sacrament of reconciliation. Because what it means is to be reconciled with the person or the community against which you have sinned. The catechism, the catechism of the Catholic Church, the Catechism of the Catholic Church says there is no offense, however serious, there is no offense, however serious, that the Church cannot forgive. I want you to hear that here. The catechism of the Catholic Church says, that at, at paragraph 982, to be precise, there is no sin, there is no offense, however serious, that the church cannot forgive. There is no one, however wicked or guilty, who may not confidently hope for forgiveness, provided his repentance is honest. In other words, sisters and brothers, it has nothing you could do. It has nothing, nothing, zero, nothing, that you could do that God is not willing to forgive. Once your repentance because some of us believe that, you know, what we do, the sin we commit is so grave, is so bad, is so, you know, is so humiliating for us that we can't go to God. That no, not, no, God can't confess that. You know, we can't confess that to God. The catechism of the church tells us there is no one, however wicked or guilty, who may not confidently hope for forgiveness. Provided his repentance is honest. So, sisters and brothers, it has nothing you could do. There's, not, there's no sin you could commit that God is not willing to forgive. And for me, that's grace. That because the kind of foolishness I do in my life, the kind of dotishness I do, the kind of sins I commit, if I didn't believe that God would forgive me, I'm in trouble today. I get serious, serious trouble. And that's what I want us to take away from this. That there's nothing, there's absolutely nothing that you can do that God is not willing to forgive. There's no mountain to fall at all. God is willing to walk with you once your repentance is honest. God is willing to forgive once your repentance is honest. How many sacraments are there? Seven, yes? Of the seven sacraments, there are three in which we ask to make a confession. Do you know which three are those? Quite obvious, of course, the sacrament of confession, sacrament of reconciliation. What is the second one? We went through today, communion, the Eucharist. But there's a third one where we make a confession as part of the sacrament, the anointing of the sick. There are three sacraments. So apart from the apart from the, the, the sacrament of reconciliation, the two other sacraments where we call upon to make a confession is the sacrament of the, of the Holy Eucharist and those of us who receive the anointing of the sick. Because part of this part of, of part of the administration of that sacrament is that you have to you, you have to make a confession. And for the anointing of the sick, it's it's you know that when you when you some people think it's when only when you're on your deathbed. You know, when you're sick and the priest comes home to you or comes to the hospital and you get the anointing of the sick. It's not something we put it as a last rite. It's not your last rites. It do mean that because you get, because you're anointed, anointing of the sick, that you could end there just now. It's not that. It's an anointing of the sick. Use the oil, using oil of prison. Yeah? So there are three times when we do that. There are and Father was talking about how we do things in threes today. So there are three times, there are three of the seven sacraments in which 
we ask the need for confession. I like to think that there are four steps in making a good confession, in, in embracing the sacrament of re reconciliation. And when we read the parable of the prodigal son, as I indicated, you see the four steps very, very clearly articulated there. And the first step is the recognition. The recognition and admission of your sin. That's so when we come to Mass, for instance, one of the first parts of the Mass is that is that period, the penitential right, where we say, I confess to Almighty God that I've sinned, you know, through my own fault, my grievous fault, in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and what I have failed to do. Yeah? So that's one of the first the first thing is to recognize that you have sinned, that I have sinned. So if you look at any of the, the, the 12 steps program, for instance, Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, whatever it is, what is it when people stand up, what is the first thing they say? My name is Neil Parsonal and I'm an alcoholic. That's the first thing you would see. Because there's, there has to be recognition, there has to be admission that this is who I am. I am a sinner. That's the first thing. You have to recognize that you're a sinner. You recognize that you're sick. Because if you don't recognize that, the first step to recovery is admission. The first step to reconciliation is to admit that you've done something wrong. Because if you don't believe you do anything wrong, you know what the purpose of going to confession is to satisfy somebody else. Because you know full well you're going to do the same thing again. So if you, you unless you're willing to admit, I have sinned, then your confession, you remember, as I said, what the Catholics have said, once their repentance is honest. Yeah? So in the parable of the prodigal son, the, 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 the first part, this often talks about the, you know, the, the, the son, you know, asking for his share of the property and going away. From, from verses 14 to 17, it says, when he had spent it all, that country experienced a severe famine, and now he began to feel the pinch. So he hired himself out to one of the local inhabitants, who put him on his farm to feed the pigs. And my boy would have willingly filled his belly with the husks the pigs were eating, but nobody offered him anything to eat. Then he came to his senses. Then he came to his senses, and he said, how many of my father's paid servants have more food than they want, and here am I dying of hunger. I will leave this place and go to my father. You recognize the mistake you make. You recognize the sin you've committed. And some of us, we so hardened and we so stubborn that instead of recognizing the hole we're digging for ourselves and stop. We continue digging. We continue digging. Because my boy here in this in, 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 in this in this parable could have easily said, Well, you see me, I sure if I go back home, my father I can walk me again. And I show my elder brother, well, he 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 want nothing to do with me. I don't talk to my mother. So you see me, let me just stay here. And remain in the big side. Anybody here ever or, or, or has you know participated in Feeding pig pens. Yeah? How would it smell? No. Not so nice at all. And that is that, that, that is putting it very mildly. So you can imagine my boy here, a Jew, yeah, who's not supposed to be mixing with pig at all. In the pig pen. In the pig pen. Had a clean up after their pig. And watching the, the, even the husks the pigs eating. And very grumbling. You ever reach that stage? When you're so hungry, your belly started to talk to you. And you have nothing to eat, and you have seen nothing to eat. That is the position the boy was in. That is the position the boy was in. And therefore, he came to his senses. And sisters and brothers, part of the challenge we have is that so many of us, so many times, don't come to his senses. 
We remain out there in a distant country and we do not come to our senses. We prefer to stay outside of the church. We prefer to stay outside of our families. We prefer to stay outside of our communities rather than come to our senses. We prefer to stay outside of our classrooms rather than come to our senses. But the first step in this circle is the recognition coming to our senses that what I have done is foolishness. That I have sinned. I have sinned. So that's the first part. And the second part is remorse. So you have to be sorry for yourself. You have to be sorry for what you did. So there's a recognition that I played a fool. Recognition that, you know, I wasn't my best self. And then the second part is that you have to be, you have to be sorry for what you did. Because if you're sorry for what you do, well, then you're wasting your time. You're wasting your time. So he says that after he comes to his senses, he said, I will leave this place and go to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. Treat me as one of your paid servants. You can imagine you, you telling your father and mother that. I don't deserve to be called your son. I don't deserve to be called your child. Treat me like one of your hired servants. So there's remorse there. There's that sense of the gravity of the situation has sunk in. I am feeling sorry for what I have done. I am feeling sorry for what I have done. At the Mass, just before we receive communion, remember what you say? Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but when you say the word, my soul shall be. There is remorse. I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof. So there's the recognition of what we've done is wrong. There's that sense of sorrow that sense of sorrow for what we have done. And the third one is restitution. So you have recognition, you have remorse, and you have restitution. Restitution with those who we have wronged. So if you recall the story of Zacchaeus, for instance. Remember Zacchaeus in the Bible? And the story of Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus was this little short man. Zacchaeus was this little short man. And Jesus was passing. And Zacchaeus was, was a tax collector. Zacchaeus was one of the, you know, the higher ups in society. Corrupt no day. And because he was so short, he climbed up a sycamore tree in order to be able to see Jesus. Because although as sinful as he was, he still wanted a relationship with Jesus. He still wanted to see Jesus. So he climbed up the sycamore tree. And as Jesus was passing, he said, hey, where are you doing up there? Come down. Tonight, I'm coming by your house and mine. Tonight, I'm coming by your house and mine. He says, Today salvation has come to your house. And Zacchaeus says and said, Lord, here and now, I will give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Zacchaeus was so convicted by God. Zacchaeus was so convicted of what God, the, the, the fact that this Jesus, that this Jesus was willing, knowing who Zacchaeus was, knowing how sinful he was, knowing how, 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 how this rest of the society saw him as this bad, 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 bad person. That Jesus would actually say, hey, me and you like him tonight. Me and you go here and sit down and have a meal and a beverage tonight are coming by your house. In other words, there's reconciliation. There's nothing, as the Catechism says, there's no sin too big that the church cannot forgive. And Jesus was saying to Zacchaeus, I know you already knew. I know. 
and know you esteem people. And know that. And know your sinful color. But guess what? Me and you will not sit on my feet tonight. And sisters and brothers, that's what is happening when reconciliation does cross you. That's what is happening when reconciliation does cross. It's a Jesus who says to us, I know you, you can't hide nothing from me. I know you. I know you. You can't hide nothing from me. And because you cannot hide anything from me, then let me sit down, let me sit down and, and reason up. Let me sit down and reason. Let me sit down and talk. Let me sit down and have a meal together. Come in by your house. And that is what leads to the restitution. That is what led Zacchaeus to say, whatever I have done, if I have cheated anybody, I pay them back four times the amount. And it is the same thing in the parable of the prodigal son. He says, put me to work as one of your hired servants. In other words, let me pay back. Because you will recall that at the very beginning of the parable, he says, give me my share of money. Give me my share of property, let me go. And he says to us now, he's saying to his father, let me work as one of your hired servants. In other words, there is restitution that has to take place. We have to make back up. We have to make up with the person. We have to give back. If we cheated anybody, then we had to give we had to give them back the money. We have to restore people's name. We have to do what is necessary to restore the balance, so to speak. And the fourth part, because one of the things that the just to go back, one of the things that we, we need to understand is that sin affects, as I said at the beginning, sin affects the entire community. It's not just you and, and you sin and therefore. Sin affects everybody else. Yeah? So there's restitution that has to take place. And one of the questions I want you to, to, to ask yourselves as we even as we explore the part of the prodigal son, you know, you know, on, on another level, what is the restitution that brother had to make, the younger son had to make? With the elder brother. Think about it. If on his way back home, remember the story tells us that when he was a long way off, the father saw him and the father ran to him, clasped him, hugged him up, and before he could say, you know, father, I sinned and that kind of thing, the father said, hey, hush him all, don't worry about that. We're good. Can you imagine if on his way home, the first person he encountered was the elder brother? Instead of, the, instead of the father. I want you to put yourself in that position. I want you to put yourself in that position. If on your way home, the first person you encountered was the elder brother, what would you think the conversation would have been then? How would you, as the elder brother, treated this wayward son? Because we know what he said in the end. This son of yours, when he was talking to the father, this son of yours, take all your money, spend it on wine, woman, and song. As the song, as, as the, 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 the soccer song told us, you know, this year, bamboo sharing like a sign of arm. You understand? He, he didn't leave drink for the professionals. He drinking like it going out of style. Wine, woman, and samba. Imagine that he would have met the elder brother on his way Because there are many of us, like elder brothers sitting in this congregation, many of us behave like the elder brother at times. Because we followed all the rules, we stayed. We stayed and we followed all the rules. And you have these people who went and do all kinds of things. And the church come and forgive them. So where's the sense in staying? He says to the father, I was here all the time. You ain't giving a little kid. You ain't giving a little goat. I can make a little line with my friends. You know, I'll call you goat and, 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 and dumpling. You ain't giving nothing. I hear it all the time. And there are many of us in church who are like that. We have stayed and we have followed all the rules. We come to Mass every weekend. First communion, confirmation, you name it. And then we see people come and people go. Come and go. Again. See some people come back 
And next thing they have a position on the parish council. Or they lead in something. And we see what they lead. It's not them who. And they categorize all they sin. Because you know what they did. And many of us who behave like the other ones. We just have to face the facts. The fourth part is the reconciliation. So there's recognition, there's remorse, there's restitution, and there's reconciliation. And the reconciliation is, is that part where he, the father, embraces him again. Where the father says to him, Come. Says to the, the, the servants, kill the fat and calf, bring the ring, put a ring on the finger, put the sandals on his feet, bring the best robe. So there's reconciliation and now in, in that. Regardless of how you and I look at Judas, we know the story of Judas. Judas is the one who, who betrayed Christ. Yeah? But regardless of how we interpret Judas' participation in that whole exercise, the scriptural record is clear for all of us. That the institution of the Eucharist took place in the context of the infidelity of Judas. Let us understand that. The institution of the Eucharist that we celebrate so regularly took place in the context of Judas' sin, Judas' infidelity. Judas, however, left the Last Supper knowing that Jesus still loved him. You with me? Judas would have left the Last Supper, the ultimate betrayer, still knowing that God loved him, that Jesus loved him, even to the point of death. And if that is not salvation, sisters and brothers, I don't know. Because under normal circumstances, you know how we say to people, no, you can't sit down here, you now betray me. You now sell me out for 30 pieces of silver, and I come in and sit down and me and you eating and drinking like normal. No, and I can walk you through. I'm not playing that. I'm not playing that. I can sit down and eat. How you can come and sit down and drink me a skin in my bed and nobody betrayed me? Stabbing me in my back. The Eucharist that we celebrate. Every day, or when we come on weekends, was instituted for us by Jesus in the context of Judas' sin, Judas' infidelity. And that should tell us how much Jesus loves each and every one of us. Every day, the Father said it in the act of contrition, that is our sins who nail Jesus to the cross. Every time we sin, Jesus looks at us and says, Take my body, take my blood, eat, drink. He still sees our sin and loves us despite our sin. And that is something that you and I have to aspire to all the time to be able to love people in spite of their sin. Because we could love you, you know, but. Oh, I will love you if you do so and so and so and so and so and so. I love you, you know, but we need to move to the point of loving in spite of. So you don't have to do anything. You don't have to do anything. I will love you in spite of who you are. In spite of what of how bad you feel about yourself. I will still love you. So there is the reconciliation that comes. And that's what the Father says. That's what, that, that's what, the, what the Father says to the Son. Bring the ring. Put on the robe. Kill the calf. Kill the fatted calf. We're going to have a fete yet at night. Because this Son was lost. He was dead. He's come back to life. He was lost. And he's found. There is greater rejoicing in heaven than one sinner returns to Great rejoicing. And therefore, it raises the question of, for us of, you know, how can we 
And those of us who partake of this Eucharist, who partake in the body and blood of Christ, then refuse to forgive other people. Because if God is instituting this Eucharist in the context of our sin and our infidelity, how can we then refuse to forgive people? You know, we tell people sometimes that and God face you will never see. As if we could decide who will see God face. We tell people, I'm not forgiving you, know, I will never forget you. And half of that means that you have to forgive, you have to forgive the person. Because you're holding on to that resentment. You're holding on to that root. You're not letting it go. I'm not forgive you, but I'm going to forget you. You're holding on to something. You're not letting it go. The fact that we are forgiven in the midst of that, that the Eucharist is instituted in the midst of that infidelity, should tell us that we have a responsibility to forgive others as well. And so the truth is, sisters and brothers, that we come to Mass more often than we go to confession. Amen? We come to Mass more often than we go to confession. The confession is a once in a, once in a while thing. But, you know, God willing, we have Mass every week. And Jesus uses us, and Jesus, if you read, when you read the scriptures, Jesus always uses the opportunity of a meal. Always uses the opportunity of a meal to teach valuable lessons. And meals with Jesus often provided that opportunity for reconciliation and forgiveness. And there are some very good examples of that in the scriptures. The story of the woman who anointed Jesus' feet. And this is in Luke chapter 7, 44 to 47. Jesus says to Simon, you know, Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You give me no water for my foot, but she has bathed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore I tell you, her sins which all many have been forgiven. Jesus used the opportunity of a meal to offer forgiveness to people. After Peter denied Jesus three times, this is after the after the the the, 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 the crucifixion, Jesus' resurrection. Peter's denial of Jesus is forgiven, and Peter's vocation is renewed on a beach in Galilee. You remember that story? They went out to fish after, and when they come back, they see they see a fire on the on the shore. And Jesus said, "Come, bring sit on my feet. Bring sit on my feet. Let me read this." Jesus continually uses that, and in the same way, Jesus uses the sacrament of the Eucharist, the sacrament of the Eucharist, not just the sacrament of penance, not just the sacrament of confession or reconciliation. He uses the sacrament of the Eucharist to teach us what forgiveness and what reconciliation is all about. One of the early fathers of the church, St. Ambrose, emphasized this aspect of the Eucharist in the fourth century. And he said, if we proclaim the Lord's death, we proclaim the forgiveness of sins. If as often as his blood is poured out, it is poured out for the forgiveness of sins, then we should always receive it so that we may all be we may always have forgiveness for our sins. Because if that is what we believe, that Jesus' blood is poured out for the forgiveness of sins, then we should try to receive it as often as possible. Amen? Receive it as often as possible. So let me ask you a question. How many times during the Mass, during the sacrament of the Eucharist, are there references to forgiveness and reconciliation? How many times during the Mass there's reference, do you say it, or the priest says it, there's reference to reconciliation, to forgiveness of sin during the course of the months. There are some very obvious ones. Yeah? So let's start with the very obvious ones. Who will the movies? The I confess. Yeah? So that's one. Very, very obvious. Very, very obvious. What else? Lord, I am not worthy that you should, that you should enter under my roof. That's the second one. What else? The Lamb of God. Third one. Anything else? I believe in one holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. Anybody else? Our the Our Father. 
Yes? Our Father, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. We have more. That's just five. We have five plus. I'll give you, we, we, we identify five. We have at least five plus. So let's go through the past. And you understand to help us to understand that the sacrament of the Eucharist is the sacrament of forgiveness. So we begin as 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 rightly with the confession. The I confess. I confess to Almighty God, and we do that. And, and, and in the Kyrie, we say the Lord of we, we say Lord of mercy three times, right? Eh? So we, we do the I confess, and the other part of that is Lord of mercy, Christ of mercy, Lord of mercy. So we, we, we call down on, on, on the mercy of God, and then the priest concludes that penitential right with the absolution. So when you go to confession now, when you go to confession, if you go to individual confession, you say, the, uh, you, you, you make your confession, I confess for what I have done and what I have failed to do in my thoughts and in my words. Yeah? And then Father gives you the, the absolution. So the same thing happens in, you know, at Mass. It's absolution, the Almighty God forgive us, forgive us our sins, bring us to everlasting life. Amen. So that's the first part. Only forget the Gloria. Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. You take away the sins of the world. We see your prayer. So we started with the, 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 the penitential right, baby. And then we go straight into the glory. But again, there is talk of forgiveness. There is that sense of Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You take away the sins of the world, receive our prayer. We identify the, the recitation of the creed, where it says, I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. During the consecration, during the consecration, and specifically that moment of what we call the transubstantiation, when the bread and wine are, are transubstantiated into the body and blood of Christ. At the when when it gets to the to the wine, you can take up the chalice. The priest says to us, or the priest says, the take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and of an everlasting covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many. For the forgiveness of sins. For the forgiveness of sins. So that's a consecration. And when we talk about the mystery of faith, Father says, the mystery of faith, what is one of the, 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 the antiphons we say? Save us, Savior of the world, for by your cross and resurrection, you have set us free. You have set us free. In the Lord's Prayer, we've identified that. We pray that our sins might be forgiven and that we might be delivered from evil. But then the priest says something very curious. The priest says something very curious. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. So again, that notion of the sacrament of the Eucharist being the sacrament of forgiveness. At the sign of peace, the priest says, Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church. So again, that sense of, you know, we are saved, but spare us for now, look on the feet of the church instead. Yeah? And then, at the Lamb of God, the same words we use in the Kyrie, Lord have mercy, we say it again in the Lamb of God. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. So you find, you know, pieces being repeated. And as he elevates the host prior to the communion, the, the priest says, Behold the Lamb of God. 
Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Another reference, sisters and brothers, another reference to forgiveness. Taking Jesus Christ, taking away the sins of the world. And it is at that point we say, Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter. And the very act of receiving communion, the very act of sharing communion, is that sign of forgiveness as well. The body of Christ we receive in Holy Communion is given for us, and the blood we drink is shed for the forgiveness of sin. The Catechism says that at, at paragraph 1393, for this reason the Eucharist cannot unite us to Christ without at the same time cleansing us from past sins and preserving us from future sins. So when we, receive the, the, when we receive the Eucharist, when we receive Holy Communion, it unites us to Christ, cleansing us from past sins and preserving us from future sins. I've said this to you, sisters and brothers, for you to identify that although the, you do not attend the sacrament of confession very, very regularly, the sacrament of the Eucharist, which you attend more regularly, is also a sacrament of forgiveness. There are at least, we have identified here, at least 11 references, at least 11 references to the Mass being used in furtherance of the forgiveness of our sins, helping us to identify our sins and forgiving us from our sins. And therefore, we need to look at how we, we enter into the Mass, how we enter into the celebration of that Eucharist. The woman who anointed Jesus' feet had her sins forgiven. She showed great love for Jesus. She admitted what was, what was her sins, so to speak, and Jesus forgave her. We are called in turn as people to offer forgiveness to others because of the forgiveness that we have received. The forgiveness we receive is not to keep for ourselves, but really to give to others. Today, we should celebrate what we call Laetari Sunday. You would have noticed, for instance, the father's vestments were different. He was wearing a rose-colored the, the chasuble, rose-colored as opposed to the purple that we, that we associate with, with Lent. Laetari means rejoice. Laetari Sunday is when the church calls on us to be joyful. And in that joy, the church offers for us the parable of the prodigal son. A parable of God's extreme forgiveness for his children. The parable, the, 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 one of the, the most significant parables of the mercy that God has for his children. And that is cause for us to rejoice. Amen? On this fourth Sunday of Lent, we celebrate, we celebrate the fact that despite our sin, God forgives each and every one of us. Not once, not twice, not seven times, not seventy times, not seven times, seventy times, but forever and ever. Amen. Amen.